Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchmen video broadcast. Broadcasting you from our secret broadcasting bunker at 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri, 63028. But don't tell anybody that owns black helicopters where we're broadcasting from because we're doing some dangerous things on this program. Not only am I sitting here reading pieces of paper, trying to give you the news, trying to let you know a little bit about what's going on, but I'll be reading from the most dangerous piece of paper at all, the King James Bible. We'll be getting into our uh, study on 1 Peter. Um, uh, I, can't, I, I almost didn't want to read the news today. I wanted to get right into the study, so I'm going to kind of zip through some of this stuff that's going on right now. Appreciate the comments that everyone gave to us uh, on our last broadcast about cap and trade. Well, there's apparently more to the bill than what we first imagined. And, and imagine that, a 1,200-page bill that was jammed through the House of Representatives that no one was able to read before they were told to vote on it. Now we're finding out all kinds of things about cap and trade bill. This is not a bill, and I said this last week, this is not a bill that's going to save our dear Mother Earth. Earth. This is a bill that's, in, that's intended to tax everybody and for a, another way for the government to seize control. I have some, several things on my desk uh, that I've looking at and been looking at for the past few weeks and more than likely uh, I may do a broadcast on those or a video special or something like that uh, of just the, the idiocy and the danger of the times that we're living in right now. And this, let me, let me just get to this verse here to let you know where we're headed. When we're studying 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Now, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you, nor will I ever tell you on this broadcast to your face in your church or wherever, in my church, that I think that within the next year, Jesus is going to come back and do some major tail kicking. I can't say that. But... In a, in, even in a literal sense, I can see that the end of all things as far as the America that you and I used to know or the world that you and I used to know, I think things are going to change and I think they're going to change very quickly right now. It just seems like we're on this, uh, <clears throat> we're on this like express train headed into a new world order. Anyway, let's get into the news. Under cap and trade, you must retrofit your home or you can't sell. The 1,400-page cap-and-trade legislation pushed through by House Democrats and some Republicans, I'll throw in there, contains a new federal policy that residential, commercial, and government buildings be retrofitted to increase energy efficiency, leaving it up to the states to figure out exactly how to do that. This means that homeowners, for example, could be required to retrofit their homes to meet federal green guidelines in order to sell their homes if the cap-and-trade bill becomes law. This bill, which now goes to the Senate, directs the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to develop and implement a national policy for residential commercial buildings. The purpose of such a strategy, known as the Retrofit for Energy and Environmental Performance, or REAP, that, that, that is an interesting, what is it called, acronym? REAP. Because basically, you REAP what you sow, America. You've sowed to the flesh too long. You've sowed to the special interest. You've sowed uh, to uh, uh, everybody voting for the dollar bill. And now we are reaping what we're sowing in this country. I, I, just, I just clued into that. I think it's interesting. Uh, this thing would be to facilitate the retrofitting of existing buildings nationwide. Now, unless you don't know what retrofitting is, I've done a little bit of retrofitting in, in my life. Uh, not just spiritually, although that's a, that would be a good illustration. Uh, but retrofitting, uh, I remember years ago, I used to be in the insulation business. I used to work for a guy, and we did insulation. We went into an old house that had no insulation in it whatsoever. And all the walls, I mean, this house had been lived in for probably 60, 75 years, something like that. And they wanted to put insulation inside the wall cavities. Well, there's a way you do that. We drilled holes on the outside, and we blew this uh, cellulose insulation in there and tried to fill all the uh, stud cavities that were inside the house. That's what's called a retrofit. Retrofit. Uh, it is something designed that if a house or a building has already been built, 
that needs to be brought up to these new quote unquote standards, then they're going to go in and, uh, and you, you're going to have to do this if you plan on ever selling your house. In other words, uh, your house the way it is right now, if it goes on the market, they will not accept it. This is all part of the cap and trade, but aren't you just happy about that? Aren't you just happy to know, and probably, probably more than likely, the house that you live in right now will not qualify under these new standards. So fasten your seatbelts, folks. Here we go. Hate bill will ride on defense bill. I mentioned that in a previous broadcast, I told you that, let me get out my illustrations here again, I told you that if they couldn't, if they figured out that they couldn't pass the hate crimes bill, just as a bill in itself, then what they're going to do is they're going to take it and they're going to stick it somewhere where something else is going to be voted on and they're going to put it right in there. Most people won't know it's there, although most congressmen will know that it's there. But they'll try to claim ignorance and say, well, I didn't know it was there. If you didn't know it was there, why'd you vote on it? But they'll probably find some bill, uh, and this, uh, this person uh, suggests, according to the Washington Blade, a homosexual human rights campaign, uh, and a senior Senate Democratic aide confirmed that Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid intended to pass hate crimes legislation as an amendment to the fiscal year 2010 defense authorization bill. Uh, we understand the House has concerns, but we have yet to find another vehicle uh, that will work. Uh, let's see here. House members such as Representative Bonnie Frank are concerned, I just like making fun of Barney Frank, I don't know, are concerned because Prez Obama has promised to veto the arms bill since it will spend too much money on F-22 fighter jets. Frank recommends, according to the Blade, that the jet, you know that Barney Frank's homosexual, don't you? Okay, I just, I didn't know if you knew that or not. That's why he doesn't mind being quoted by the Blade, all right? Anyway, according to the Blade, that the jet funding be reduced so that he and his fellow homosexuals may have an arms slash hate bill package not offensive to the president. That's just funny. An, an arms bill, let's see, an arms bill is designed to inflict damage, torture, and pain upon your enemy. That's what an arms bill is all about. And yet the hate crimes bill is designed to be benevolent to everybody and not harm or speak evil of anybody or anything that they're doing wrong. And uh, like it or not, they're going to find some way of sticking this somewhere in a bill somewhere just in order to get it passed. Congress has more than one trick up their sleeve, my friend. And they'll do whatever it takes. I, I, I was going to, uh, I had a thought just before I... Uh, started recording this, and maybe maybe I could do some research on it. Maybe somebody else could help me do some research on this about some of the early bills that were passed by Congress. And I'm talking about back in the year 1795 or 1804, or you know, in the early years of our Congress. I, I just imagine. I don't know for sure, but I just imagine that a bill designed to do one thing. That's all it did was do one thing. I don't know when things change in this country when a bill that had a title of we're going to fix America or something like that uh, had all these other things jammed in. But these are called earmarks now or amendments or anything else. And all these senators and all these congressmen have tons of special interest groups that lobby them constantly and say, you know, you take care of us, we'll take care of you, we'll fund your next campaign, we'll do this, we'll do all kinds of... And I don't know, maybe I'm just being pessimistic. You know, this last weekend was July 4th, and I preached our Sunday morning message, and we'll probably post it, hopefully if I get time this week, we'll post it on our blog for you to watch. But I preached last Sunday morning on the Declaration of Independence. I actually read the Declaration of Independence, and I just, I just stood aghast, and I looked at it, and I said, this is, all of this is from the Bible. And I preached the Declaration of Independence from the Bible. And I'm telling you, I've never seen a time in my life uh, where I've seen an error, and I'm going to use, I'm going to use the R word revolution. I'm telling you, there are a lot 
of people in this country who are not going to take very much more. And I, I just keep thinking back to the time of when our founding fathers decided they've had enough and they weren't going to put up with it anymore. The hate crimes bill, if it's passed, as far as I'm concerned, would be probably enough. You're looking at someone who loves the law that I think we ought to obey the law. I think we ought to, I think we ought to obey the laws that, number one, God gives us, and number two, the laws that man gives us, so long as the laws that man gives us do not contradict the laws that God gives us. I don't care what kind of man or woman they are, whether they're moral or immoral. I think you ought to obey the law. But if they're going to tell me, and if they're going to tell you as Bible-believing Christians, that you cannot say that sodomy and homosexuality and fornication, which is shacking up, and pornography and every other kind of sexual ill that is uh, thrown out in our country, if they're going to tell us that we can't say that that's wrong and that it inflicts harm upon people, if they are going to tell us that we can't say that, they might as well get ready because I'm going to say it. And I hope that you stand with me. I hope that, that when they arrest me for saying the, th these things, that you at least show up and try to give me a cake with like a file in it or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just dreaming too much. I don't, I, I don't look forward to these days. I really don't. But we were born, we were made for such a time as this. And I think we ought to stand. The last tea party. I got a call. We have a man in our church named Wayne. Wayne is one of my, uh, he's, one of my he's one of my friends. I love Wayne. And uh, Wayne called me July 4th. Him and his wife, Jan, they were down in San Antonio, Texas, or somewhere around right in there. He called me. He said he was at South Fork Ranch, you know, where Dallas, the TV show, was uh, supposedly filmed and all that. They were having a tea party down there. And he was so excited. And I remember going to the last tea party. Uh, by the way, he said there was like 30,000 people there. And I don't recall seeing that on the CBS Nightly News with Katie Couric. I don't remember anything about that. But anyway, um, the last tea party, you remember we did a tea party special here on this broadcast. And the last tea party, I mean, I saw everywhere people with signs and people with literature handing them out talking about auditing the Federal Reserve System the Federal Reserve. And uh, I'm, I, I had not really heard of that before, but apparently, and a lot of these people were Ron Paul followers, and apparently Ron Paul had sponsored a bill, and in fact, I'll probably read the article here in a little bit, but Ron Paul had spon sponsored a bill to audit the Federal Reserve. And over the time, all of these senators and congressmen began jumping on it and saying, yeah, we think we ought to audit the Federal Reserve. I remember looking at those things, and maybe I'm just too, bit of, too much of a skeptic, but I looked at that and I'm going, that's never going to happen. It is never, in a million years, it is not going to happen. Well, maybe I won't say a million years. How about, a, how about five years, ten years? It won't happen. They will not audit the Federal Reserve. The, uh, it, and, and well, let me, let me read the article. Senate blocks bill, duh, to audit the Fed as government prepares for second round of looting. Senator Jim DeMint slams Fed's monopoly, questions where trillions in bailout funds has gone. A Senate, a Senate amendment based on Congressman Ron Paul's successful House bill to audit the Federal Reserve was blocked by the Senate yesterday evening on procedural grounds, as Jim DeMint slammed the Fed for refusing to disclose where trillions in bailout funds had gone, while a top Obama administration advisor called for a second stimulus package to be prepared. Republican Senator Jim DeMint uh, had attempted to get a provision attached to the 2010 spending bill that would have removed strict restrictions on auditing the Fed's discount window operations, funding facilities, open market operations, and agreements with foreign central banks and governments. However, the amendment was blocked by Senate authorities who claimed, now this is funny, who claimed that it violated rules for provisions attached to spending rules. So, this, this, see, this is just funny to me. Here you have some, some very well-meaning American patriot senators who are concerned that the rules in the Senate would be violated 
by trying to attach a bill that would audit the Federal Reserve. We're just trying to make sure that the rules are followed. Listen, fellas, the reason why the books need to be audited is because most people think that the rules are not being followed. It just, I don't know, it's just one of those things where, let me read this verse again. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And I can tell you that when I read things like this, I, I, I hate it. I hate, I hate doing what I have to do here in saying what I have to say. I hate this. Because I love my country. I love the country I grew up in. I love the country that I'm trying to raise my children in. I would like to have the same kind of country that I grew up in for my children and my grandchildren. I don't have any grandchildren yet, but I would like to have that same kind of country. And I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. But I just don't think it's going to happen. When the interest of the will of the people of the United States of America are tossed aside like garbage in favor of cover-ups, special interest, government power, and ultra-big businesses only interested in making more and more and more money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Watch unto prayer, people. They're not going to pass, ever, a, a bill to audit the Federal Reserve System. It, it would surprise me, and that's not a prophecy. That's not, thus saith the Lord, and, and, and I, maybe in a year when they pass a bill to audit the Federal Reserve, you can email me and say, Pastor Mike, you were wrong, and I would gladly admit that I would love to be wrong on this one. But it's not going to happen. There are too many people who have too many dirty hands and the dirty money too many people have too much power that have dirty hands and the dirty money, and they are never, ever, ever going to allow the American people to see those books. It's not going to happen. So, that leads us to our next story, the News Tribune. Guard units trained for militia attacks. <sighs> Camp Crowder, Missouri. Well, here we go, pick it on Missouri again. I mean, I think Missouri people are nice. I mean, I'm nice. And I live in Missouri. I've been here since I was, well, I was uh, four years old, I think. Uh, so I think Missouri people are nice. But here again, we have another news story coming out of Missouri. Camp Crowder, Missouri. It isn't easy being an insurgent in Neosha, Missouri. The long hours, the blistering heat, and of course, constantly having to come up with new ways of uh, har harassing the Missouri National Guardsmen training in the area. Such, what, such was the case for several members of the headquarters detachment of the 229th Multifunctional M Medical Battalion. Uh, during the battalion's annual training exercise, eight members of the Jefferson City Base Unit acting as fictitious militant group attempted to, to disrupt the battalion's operations through attacks and harassment. The battalion's other two units, the Kansas City Base 205th Area Support Medical Company, and the Springfield-based 206th Area Support Medical Company fended off the attacks while performing their medical duties. Duties. Now, this is uh, this is like a military of uh, what is that called? War games, uh, where they're planning. Now, I want you to get this: their side is planning an attack from, let's say, let's say our side. Although I'm not planning an attack on anybody. I'm not. I'm not, uh, I'm not marshalling uh, troops. I'd, I, we're not having secret meetings in our secret bunker here at uh, 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri. Uh, we're not sitting down in the basement with the, uh, the patriot movement of the Missouri militia planning how we're going to blow up buildings in St. Louis or Kansas City or Jefferson City, which is the capital of Missouri. We're not planning these things. But apparently, they think that there are a lot of people that are doing this. And you know what? They may be right. Just because that some people say that they're on the right wing doesn't mean they're right. And just because some people say they're patriots doesn't really mean that they're patriots. You know what really, what really unnerves me? is that, yes, I think America needs a change. I think it needs a drastic change from the way things are. The problem is, who's going to lead that change? 
and what's it going to be like on the other side and I don't think people have put a lot of thought into that what is it going to be like on the other side of a drastic change that takes place inside of this country but let me get back to my focus here let me let me focus let me see down the tunnel here and look at what's going on here they're planning and we've we've talked about the um, Missouri State Patrol report that uh, labels uh, right-wing people and anti-abortion groups as terrorists, and we see the uh, Pentagon doing the same thing. National, the Department of Homeland Security doing the same thing. And, and, and then we have, uh, even before that, we had whole divisions of the Army that were coming inside the United States, uh, preparing themselves, preparing themselves and training inside the borders of this country for what we think is going to be martial law. And now we have the Missouri Militia, which is the Missouri National Guard. Uh, they're training for alleged militia, 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 my sister's name is Melissa, militia attacks that they think are going to take place inside the state of Missouri. And you know what? They may be right. There's enough stuff going on in this country right now, and people are mad. And there's not much more that people are going to take. And we're, to, we're not even into the first year of President Barack Obama's presidency. And yet they're already training for this. My question is, how come we're not? And I'm not saying how come we're not out in the woods having exercises on how to shoot people. But how come we're not spiritually planning and preparing ourselves for days that lie ahead of us? You know, it's easy. Right now, it's easy to live our life and all these all these problems that we think we have are pseudo problems they're not real problems they're pseudo problems they're problems that we have when we don't have any other problems when you're fleeing for your life because you're under heavy persecution because you are born again that is a real problem when your family has no food to eat whatsoever that's a real problem but we're concentrating on all these little petty problems that we think that we have all the time I think what I think we ought to think about that the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. How do we prepare ourselves spiritually for what's going to happen? Prayer and Bible reading. Prayer and Bible reading. Prayer and Bible reading. And you cannot prepare spiritually for what's going to happen by watching American Idol. It won't happen. Strange martial law via food control. Not what the American people ordered. House uh, H.R. 2749, martial law on the enslavement of their farmers. H.R. 2749 is a strange bill in many ways. While the other food safety bills have been around since winter, allowing for much public discussion on the Internet, H.R. 2749 has only suddenly appeared. Boy, that, isn't that funny? It, it is a mutant conglomeration of the worst of the other bills with the addition of one very original part, martial law. When it was a draft, it was Waxman's bill. You remember, you remember Henry Waxman, don't you? Okay, it was Waxman's bill. Uh, but once given a number, it became Dingle's. That's Charles Dingle, or I think it's Charles Dingle, who already had a food safety bill, HR seven five nine. So Waxman got none. Dingle got two. Let's see here. Here's a look at what HR two seven four nine. Uh, would do. Here's some of the provisions that are in the bill. Number one, it would impose an annual registration fee of $500 on any quote-unquote facility that holds, processes, or manufactures food. Isn't this every home in the U.S. and every garden? Although farms are exempt, the agency has defined farm narrowly. And people making foods such as lacto-fermented vegetables, cheeses, or breads would be required to register and pay the fee, which could drive beginning and small producers out of business during difficult economic, economic times. H.R. 2749 would empower FDA to regulate how crops are raised and harvested. It puts the federal government right on the farm, dictating to our farmers. H.R. 2749 would give, F give the FDA the power to order a quarantine of a geographic area, including prohibiting or restricting the movement of food or of any vehicle being used or that has been used to transport or hold such food within the geographic area. My wife transports food every week. She goes shopping with her mother every Saturday. And I can just about tell you at any time of the day what aisle she's in. My wife's pretty ordered that way. And she hauls food back home to our family every week. I wonder if her car, her van, would fall into this category. Uh, H.R. 2749 would empower FDA to make random 
warrantless searches of the business records of fall, small farmers and local fruit producers without any evidence whatsoever that there has been a violation. H.R. 2749 changes the Secretary of Health and Human Services with establishing a tracing system for food. Each person who produces, manufactures, processes, packs, transports, or holds such food. Why didn't they just like put in here like any person who eats food would have to maintain the full pedigree of the origin and previous distribution history of the food and establish and maintain a system for tracing the food that is interoperable with the systems established and maintained by other such persons. This bill does not explain how far the traceback will extend or how it will be done for multi-ingredient foods. With all these ambiguities, it's far from clear how much it will cost either the farmers or the taxpayers. I'll tell you how much it's going to cost. It's going to cost our freedoms in this country. At, at, at some point, at, I, I should have like a big bag of straw here. And at some point, they're going to add the last straw. And people are going to be fed up with it. Senate bill finds people refusing health coverage. Americans who refuse to buy affordable medical coverage could be hit with fines of more than $1,000 under a health care overhaul bill unveiled Thursday by key Senate Democrats looking to fulfill President Barack Obama's top domestic priority. The Congressional Budget Office estimated the fines will raise around $36 billion over 10 years. You know what? They want people to disobey the law. When they start fining people and then they estimate how much money they're going to make from people disobeying the law, then they want people to disobey the law so that they can make more money off of it. Stupid. What, it's stupid the country we live in. I love America, but we're stupid. We elected stupid people to run our government. God, if that was wrong, I'm sorry. But I'm telling you, this is, this is crazy. Um, they're going to pass, they're going to pass health care. There's, there's little doubt in my mind about it. They're going to pass health care. And it's going to be one of those things where you don't have a choice. You don't have freedom and you don't have a choice. And now it looks like that when they pass a health care bill, you won't even have the choice to opt out of it. You'll have to do it or you'll have to pay a fine for not having health care. Now, here's one that I've got my eyeball on. In fact, I want you to do this. I want you to, I want you to help me research something. And by the way, we are going to release uh, the long-awaited, long-discussed, long-talked-about video called Triple Helix. We're going to release that next month to everybody that's on our watchers list. If you've not been put on our watchers list, uh, give us a call at 636-937-3233, or you can send us an email. I prefer an email. Uh, because then I can just copy and paste your address from uh, the email to our watchers list and we get you on the list and Bonnie gets you right out. We just mailed yesterday uh, the watchers list packets for the month of July. You're getting all of our Watchmen video broadcasts for the month of June. You're getting all of the sermons preached on Sunday morning. Uh, you're getting all the Sunday school lessons. I also threw in a couple of messages from a good pastor friend of mine down in Norwood, Missouri. And uh, this month, I'm adding some extra things to it, uh, to the teaching, uh, such as, uh, well, let's see, I won't be adding them. Uh, I didn't, they, they're not coming out this, in this mail out, but they will be coming out in August. I'm doing a teaching on Laodicea and the church at Laodicea, and that would be included in the packet. But in this month, you're also getting uh, the next two videos in the series called the King James Code. You're getting volume two and volume three, which is on the number three and on the number four. I hope that's not too confusing for you. But anyway, just watch the video and you'll figure it out. So those two videos are coming to you. But if you're not on our watchers list, please get on our watchers list. And all that we ask is that you help us out with some kind of donation. Our, as you can guess, our watchers list is growing. And so is our uh, demands for um, getting out DVDs. We're, we're ordering a lot more DVDs than I ever thought we would be. And uh, trying to get the postage out. Our postage has increased. And so if you can help us out just a little bit, I, I we really, really would appreciate it. Appreciate all those that give uh, so far. But uh, anyway... Uh, that video is coming out in next month's, uh, the month of August, uh, Watchers Packet. So be watching for it. But I'd like for, uh, I'd like for people to help me research something and something that I've already started putting together. There is, there is a lot of special interest power brokers and a lot of money that's pushing this universal health care coverage in the United States of America. My question is, why? 
Why is it, why is it so important to those that are in power that they pass universal health care? I don't believe for one second that the top leaders in both houses of Congress and President Barack Obama really care that much about sick and hurting people. I don't think that. I don't think they care that much at all. I think there's an agenda behind it. And I want you to help me find Now, my, I'll tell you what my guess is. And you'll figure... In fact, let me read this to you and then see if you can guess what my guess is. All right? Flu vaccine will be DNA-based. Get ready for your flu shot, everyone. When Obama's new health care package gains traction, you can bet one of the primary features will be compulsory vaccinations of all participants. This is especially, uh, concer this is especially concerning given the news uh, that Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius has just offered $35 million to a privately owned company called Protein Sciences to re refine its DNA-based vaccine against swine flu. Now, can you guess what I'm guessing? I think that the healthcare thing has a lot to do with, and we've got videos on DNA, we've got videos on the secret concerning DNA, and the secret of uh, the New Age movement and everything, and I think, it has, I think it has a direct connection with the mark of the beast. And I haven't put all the pieces together yet, but I, I'm start, I've got the edges worked out, I think. I think I've got the edges of the puzzle worked out, now I'm gonna try to concentrate on the center. See if you can help me out with research. A lot of you have helped me in tremendous ways, and I appreciate it so much. But it just concerns me what it is that's going on in our world right now. Uh, the, 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 anyway, just help me research that. I'm going to move on. Rick Warren envisions coalition of faith. I told you a couple weeks ago that Rick Warren was going to, uh, he was going to speak. He was going to preach for the Muslims. He's now the greatest imam the most popular Muslim imam that lives in the United States of America, Reverend, the Reverend Rick Warren, is preaching to the Muslims. Reverend Rick Warren, one of America's best-known evangelical Protestant and Muslim pastors, pleaded with about 8,000 Muslim listeners on Saturday night to work together to solve the world's greatest problems by cooperating in a series of interfaith projects. Hold on right here. The world's greatest problem, Reverend Warren, is sin, and the Muslims don't have a solution to the sin problem. The only solution to the sin problem, Reverend Warren, is something that you should have learned back in your Bible college days. Something that, I mean, I would assume that you have at one time, at one time in your life read a King James Bible, and you should know that the only solution to the sin problem, the world's greatest problem, is the cross of Jesus Christ. And yet you have the audacity to go stand in front of 8,000 lost people who are going to die and go to hell. And they're going to do so because there was a man who had a chance to tell them the truth. And he refused. He refused to tell them the truth that the cross of Jesus Christ is what makes a difference. Mr. Warren said, Muslims and Christians can work together for the common good without compromising my convictions or your convictions. He said during an evening session of the annual convention of the Islamic Society of, Society of North America, ISNA, at the Washington Convention Center. I am not interested in interfaith dialogue, but interfaith projects, said the pastor of the 24,000 member Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, who is widely known for his bestseller, The Purpose Driven Life. Talk is cheap, but love is something we do together, he added. As the two largest faiths on this planet, more than one billion Muslims and two billion Christians, I don't think so, Mr. Warren. As Muslims and Christians, we must believe in this. As more than half the world, we must do something to model what it is to live in peace and to live in harmony. Now, I want to go back to this statement that he said, Muslims and Christians can work together for common good without compromising my convictions. You're wrong there. You're wrong there, uh, Mr. Uh, what's your last name? Warren. Yeah, I kind of go blank every now and then. You're wrong there. It's compromising. I want to read the scriptures. It's compromising to work with these people in any way. Straight. So number one, you have just compromised your convictions. Number two, the convictions of Muslims. He said you can work with us without compromising your convictions. Well, you know what the convictions of Muslims is, don't you? Kill the Christians. Kill all the Christians. Convert them to Islam or kill them. That's what they believe. 
And so he's lying. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's like the first thing out of the chute that God says to us is to not be yoked together with unbelievers. I mean, you, I mean, you can read on what righteousness, unrighteousness, light and darkness, Christ blood. You can read all those things. But the very first thing that God says is to not be yoked together with unbelievers. Muslims are unbelievers. They do not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They do not believe in his substitutionary atonement for man's sins. And they definitely do not believe that we are saved and will inherit eternal life by grace and not through works. Titus chapter 1 verse 15, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Mr. Warren wants to do good works with people who according to the scriptures are incapable of doing good works. Bethel Church, that's, that's us, Bethel Church. Now, this is a different Bethel church. This is uh, a pastor and a pastor ret, Bill and Benny Johnson. Uh, by the way, my wife, she's not like co-pastor here. We don't do that here at this Bethel church. We don't do that. And we, there's something else that we don't do here at this Bethel church. Here's a video clip of their worship service. Take a look. Folks, we need to get the Bible back in our churches. Can I, can I hear you say amen? We need to get the Bible back in our churches. 1 Peter chapter 4, but the end of all things, verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober. Now, I, I like to have a good time. I like, to, uh, I like to cut up with my Christian friends and our church people and uh, even, every now and then, some of you guys send me something funny in the email. I like that stuff. But it's time to be sober now. It's time. There, there has to be a time when we have to wake up and say, things are not right. And I can definitely see that something is about to give in this world. Something is changed. Change is in the air. And I'm not saying that Jesus is coming back in one year. I'm not saying he's coming back December the 21st, 2012 either. I'm not saying that. I am saying that we can see clearly from the Bible and from what's going on around us, we can see that, that something's coming. The watchman is watching and I'm looking and I'm seeing the sword coming. And I'm alarmed at that and it's time to be sober. Not to have a mosh pit in our church and do crowd surfing. Which, by the way, that is turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Anytime you have your hands like that all over a male or a female person's body, that's not holy. And that's not a holy spirit that's guiding it. That's wicked. It's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. This is why we have to be sober. This is why this, this program has to be serious. I mean, we're dealing with deadly serious things here. 
And anybody that knows me personally knows that I like to laugh and cut up and have a good time. And, and I'm, I'm always one of these that, you know, and I'm, I don't, you know, that if somebody's feeling down or something like that, I always try to cheer them up with some wise crack or some joke or something like that, make them laugh a little bit. But it's time to be sober. It's time to be sober, sober, and it's time to watch unto prayer. See, this is what this program is about. It's about watching. But it's not seeing with our physical eyes what's going on. It's asking God to open our spiritual eyes to see what's going on. That's what watching unto prayer is, is all about. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I like that word charity. I don't like the new translations for anything, and I especially don't like what they did to the word charity. The word charity is the, is the most pure kind of love that there is because the Bible defines the word love in case you don't know what that is the Bible defines the word love listen to this for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. you see loving pure love charity love is giving that's what love is. pure love is not taking pure love is giving. And that's how the Bible defines it. And that's why I like this word charity here. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know what I think? I think that if you see God's people having a need, you need to help take care of that need. That's what, that, that's, what that's all about. It's about God's people having a need, and you help them with that need. I appreciate those who who will send me an email and, and they'll tell me some things that are going on in their life and they don't want me to fix their problems. They just ask me, Pastor Mike, would you pray about this? And I'm always, I'm always try my best that as soon as I read someone's email like that, I stop what I'm doing right then and I pray for them. Somebody emailed me today about a situation and I prayed about that situation. I know I have a lot of things to pray for, but I prayed today for that situation and I, I, I can't fix it by sending money and I can't fix it by any other means but I can pray and that's what we do because this person that emailed me I don't know them if they walked up on the street and said hi Pastor Mike I'd go who are you I wouldn't know who they are but God put a little bit of and watch this the word charity is related to the word care God put a little bit of care in my heart for the needs of God's people and I love God's people and I care about them and I want to help. And I, and I feel like, that. And I, and I love this verse. The first, I read this verse one day, and I just wept. I wept. Because it says, charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I've always tried to be honest and open with people. And letting them know that I'm not some great spiritual giant that I am so far removed from worldliness and sin that I just don't understand anybody that does. You're looking at a guy that understands, okay? And I'm glad that God's charity toward me has covered a multitude of my sins. And I feel a duty and a responsibility to take people that are made out of the same dirt that I am and to help them and to encourage them, and to care about them, and to love them. Because in doing so, I'm fulfilling the law of Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, he did it for me. And every man, uh, verse, uh, verse 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. Stop complaining about what you're doing for somebody. And if you do things in your church and you do them for the Lord, then don't complain that no one else is helping you. In fact, probably what would really help a lot of pastors and a lot of churches in this world is for a lot of pastors and a lot of church members to stop complaining about how bad they have it, especially when they're doing the work of the Lord. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. And every man, and as every, every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I, you know, something that is lacking, something that we have lost sight of in this world is stewardship. 
We are servants of the Most High God, and God has placed in our hands a responsibility, a stewardship. And it is required in stewards, you and I, who are the stewards, that we're to be found faithful and obedient to God. If God, if God has given you a gift, then start searching out for a use of that gift. Don't do it on your own because then you're going against God's will. But start pleading with God. God, you've allowed me to, God, you've given me this. Now what do you want me to do with it? I remember struggling for years, struggling for years with the knowledge that God was pouring into me through the pages of the Bible. And I remember telling a good friend of mine, I said, I have all of this in me. I, I want to get it out. I have no way of getting it out. And finally, now, I have a way of getting it out. God has given me a stewardship, and it's my responsibility to say things that some others apparently are not wanting to say. But if God has given you one of those, then seek out by the grace of God how you can perform the, the gifts that he has given you. If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. You know what he's saying, don't you? Here's the oracles of God right here. That means that when you speak, use King James English. Make sure that when you speak, and when you are, are talking to someone about the gospel, you're trying to convert someone to the... Don't give them philosophy. Don't give them vain deceits. Don't give them words of wisdom. You give them the word of God. And that way, if they reject the Bible, then they've rejected it all. Don't try to rely upon your own wisdom. If any, man, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things, in all things, people, may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever and amen. Now, I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to make a little mark here, and I'm going to pick this back up. In verse 12, because verse 12 to me was the key to the entire, entire book of 1 Peter. And I would know we've been doing this, and I haven't done it every week, and it's taken us a while. Usually, if you, I mean, if you get to know me, if you hear some of our stuff, our Sunday school lessons and that, it takes me a while to get through something, especially when I start a book and start working through it. It takes a while. I mean, we're here to learn. Let's dig deep, and let's learn some things from the Word of God. Let's not just make it shallow, but let's dig deep. And it's taken me a while to get to verse 12 of chapter 4, but now we're here, and I want to be sure that I have time to devote to it. So be watching, and we'll see what happens. I don't, I don't plan, I'm not sitting right here planning the show for next week, but I will tell you that I'm going to try to get to this, and it's, I'm going to give it its due attention. And you read ahead, and you read this chapter, and, and ask the Lord what He's telling you on this. And we'll see if we can get our hearts and our spirits together next week. All right? Hey, look forward to seeing you. We're having our Bethel homecoming August 1st and 2nd. So far, uh, I don't have anybody coming. And I'm kind of getting a little nervous. We're going to have a bunch of fried chicken and, and barbecue sitting out for everybody. And I hope that you're there to eat it. So we invite you to come August 1st and 2nd uh, to Bethel Church. Uh, we uh, have made some announcements on our blog. But get in contact with our ministry. Let us know whether or not you're able to attend. And we appreciate it if you make the effort uh, to come out and meet us. And we got some special things planned for you. So we hope we get to see you. God bless you. I love you. This is Pastor Mike. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.